Welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. I have back on the show the ever so popular Dr. Stephen Greer. Uh, Stephen was an ER doctor that has turned into a researcher of all things UFO extraterrestrial. He has amazing films of which I've watched unacknowledged. I watched many years ago. Uh, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind came after that, seen that as well. And he has another one coming out called The Lost Century about basically like everything that we have not known or has been hidden from us and technologies that we should have in our reality that we don't. Um, but of course, this episode, if anybody's paid attention to my podcast, you maybe have come across his first episode, his first interview with me a few years ago. Again, very popular. And we talked about, of course, extraterrestrials, the government and programs. This was just a deeper dive into that. And it was all very much spawned from, you know, everything that's gone on recently with the balloons being shot down and perhaps crafts and what's going on. So Stephen is a wealth of knowledge. He's been at this for many, many decades, and he just has a mission to, well, it's the last question I ask him. You'll have to watch. You'll have to see what is the what is Stephen's mission because he really puts himself out there and he puts himself in potential danger. He has a real passion for it and he'll be at the National Press Club again, of which he hasn't been there for quite some time. And it was a big deal the first time and he says he has even more whistleblowers this year. So um, very exciting. So please enjoy the episode. Uh, click subscribe, um, hit the like button, let me know in the comments what you think. Um, it's always fascinating to hear other stories about perhaps what have you seen or if there are people that have had interactions with the government, like come forward, he will protect you and you can, um, you know, get your story out there and let's, get, let's all get a little enlightened. <laughs> Enjoy the episode. We meet again. Where are you right now? I am in Washington, D.C. If I look that way, I'll see the White House and the Washington Monument. So um, we're, I'm here at my uh, place in Washington. So you have a place there or you're working there right now? I have a home here and a home out near the University of Virginia near uh, in the Blue Ridge Mountains, a farm out there. But um, I come here about you know a third of the time for meetings with the work we're doing um, that, are, you know, that we can talk about. And it's a lot of exciting things that have happened since we uh, last spoke. Oh, I know. <laughs> That's why I thought it was such a good time, and especially with everything that's been happening. So, you know, obviously lately, like balloons, are they spies? <laughs> are they weather balloons? Are they are they anything? Were there craft? Like what on earth has been going on the last few weeks? So really what's been going on, it started with the Chinese balloon. It was obviously a spy balloon. We shot it down in the discussion uh, or not. Then there were the three other objects and events um, that appeared in the subsequent weeks after that. Those were most likely uh, just civilian drones, balloons, or perhaps something we had that was classified. They were not extraterrestrial vehicles, uh, et cetera, and so on. Now, the part of it that's very suspicious is that all of that happened within about a week of me escorting the first top secret witness into D.C. to provide testimony about what he knows about this issue um, through the new law that was passed and signed just before Christmas of 2022 that allows top secret people to come forward and speak about this issue, even though they have non-disclosure agreements and top secret clearances. Mm. So this is something we've been working on and advocating for for a long time. It's now enshrined in law. And there's a mechanism for these people to come forward. And one of the th narratives that people need to remember is that people such as the co-chair of the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee, Marco Rubio, has been gaslit by a number of counterintelligence and, and disinformation people who have been telling him all the UFOs and UAPs are maybe they're from China. So all of a sudden, we're providing clear evidence that these are real. Some are extraterrestrial, some are man-made, very classified, illegal uh, anti-gravity propulsion systems that have been funded through deep black funds uh, hmm. and companies like my uncle's company. My, my uncle uh, helped design the lunar module. His company was Northrop Grumman, huge aerospace company. So I think that part of that whole uh, operation was a sort of a psyop, psychological warfare op, 
And of course, the media lapped it up. There were no experts that got on that provided any uh, insight into this. And uh, the you know hysteria in the public, hysteria in, in the media, I think was a very calculated move. Uh, one of the things we've worried about for years, Danica, is that at, at a certain time when all this begins to come out, which is beginning to, um, they could stage some sort of threat from outer space false flag operation. And it sure as heck looked like a warm up for that uh, in the past month. I mean, what is the potential? I feel like, I mean, I obviously don't run in the same circles that you do and to that mm -hmm. to that depth. I'm just like high level mm -hmm. curiosity. But definitely from like a spiritual community perspective, there's definitely been a lot of people that have talked about the fact that a false flag is probably what we're preparing for. And what would so mm -hmm. why would they be doing a false flag? Mm -hmm. And what would the role of that be? When I heard there was those green lights, I think, over Hawaii, I mm -hmm. was like, oh, man, drones could do that at night so easily. Um, so, yeah, to talk about the talk about the potential of a false flag and what they would do and why. Well, this this go, takes us back to the 50s. So I have a CIA document that I got after I briefed uh, the director of the CIA on this issue in uh, December of 1993. So we're going back almost 30 years. And I got a cache, a box of documents from the agency. And one of them was describing the psychological warfare value of the UFO issue. Uh, and it was signed by the director of the CIA at the time, Walter Bedell Smith, uh, and it was dated 1953, before even I was born, never mind you. So um, I was born in 55. So interestingly, what we see with this is a 70-plus uh, a year long-term strategy on this issue. And, of course, as you know, the guy who invented the rocket for Adolf Hitler, Werner von Braun, on his deathbed, told his senior assistant, Carol Rosen, who's on my team, who's now in her late 70s, that, uh, in fact, uh, this entire threat of an alien invasion was always in the cards starting in the 50s that they began to hoax things and, and position this whole issue into the lunatic fringe of abductions and mutilations and war of the worlds and the movie Independence Day and all this crap, excuse me, language. But, and of course, this was all, you know, sort of scripted out of CIA covert central programs as a, as an operation. So, and in reality, I tell people that what we're beginning to see ramped up. And it began after our documentary, which I know you've seen unacknowledged, yeah. hit about 760 million views worldwide. Wow. And when it hit that number up in that three quarters of a billion range, they pulled the trigger on a, a counterintelligence operation uh, headed up by Luis Elizondo and a few other people who were masters of disinformation at the Pentagon. And they roped in this young guy that I had briefed. And, and mentored for a while, Tom DeLong. And Tom DeLong was the Blink-182 guy, you know. Yeah. And he, he got he got brought in there as a front man. And this whole thing came out, the, the TTSA group to the Stars Academy. And they started saying, yes, these are real, but they're a threat to the national security. And we really don't know what they are. Well, both of those are big lies. We do know what they are. And they're not a threat to the national security, ex except the ones that are ours. Now, here's the punchline. Okay. The ones that are the UFOs that are man-made, and that's about 70, 80 percent of the ones people see, okay. are, in fact, a threat to the national security because they're, a, they're sort of a covert program that can be used in a false flag, just what we're talking about. And they have been. They can be used to stage, you know, fake abductions and mutilations and all kinds of scary stuff. Now, to what end? I mean, you asked this question. They want to be able to unite the world around a sort of totalitarian militaristic group, yeah. which, you, you know, you can't do that by just fighting a few Al Qaeda people or one country against another. The ultimate way to do that is to, as Ronald Reagan said when he gave his talk to the United Nations, wouldn't our job of creating uh, unity and uniting the world be easier if we had a common alien threat to fight, I'm quoting. I've seen yeah. I've seen him say that. Wouldn't we come yep. together if we knew that there was another entity mm -hmm. out there? Mm -hmm. How how much would we wouldn't we unite in that? Exactly. But instead of coming together in peace and common humanity 
and enlightenment and higher consciousness and everything else, we'd come together around fear and militarism. This is like the one world government that is like possibly yeah. coming down the pipeline. Or oh, probably. that already exists. I mean, yeah. the group that is running this is a transnational, meaning it's not just in the United States. It, it crosses geopolitical boundaries. So when I go up and meet with top secret people here in Washington, which I've been doing a great deal of lately, the first thing I tell them is look at a map of the world, erase all the geopolitical lines. They don't exist for the group we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. It's transnational, not international. Okay. And they operate with alacrity all over the world. Uh, and they have enormous amounts of funding. We estimate that just out of the U.S. covert programs over the decades, it's around eight to ten trillion dollars have been taken and spent on these programs. Uh, so it, it's a huge issue and a big problem on many levels, uh, because not least of which is. Not only is it the future of how we view ourselves in the universe and, and whether we become a civilization on, on an extinction level path of endless war, but remember that the technologies, and go back and look at the CNN footage of our Navy uh, F-18 Hornets chasing that what they call the Tic Tac off the coast of California, right. that white Tic Tac looking thing. Well, by the way, that was made by the Lockheed Skunk Works. I know people who've been at present when it's been loaded on C-130 cargo planes. Mm -hmm. It's ours. It's anti-gravity. What does it mean? It's an electromagnetic field propulsion. And if that were acknowledged, it would be the end of oil, gas, coal, nuclear power, solar, wind, geothermal, all of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, now people need to understand what a big statement that is. It means that we have about a hundred years where we haven't needed to destroy the biosphere or had half the world in poverty. But the power around the petrodollar system from after World War II, Bretton Woods, the power around all those commodities and all the corporate structures, your public utilities, all of that is something we don't need, frankly. <laughs> Actually, we're going to have a movie, a full length feature film coming out soon called The Lost Century. Oh, and how, wow. to re how to how to how to regain it? Uh, the subtitle is "How to Regain It," and we just finished it. We hope it comes out June, July this year, and it's going to be a two-hour feature film. It's going to pull the curtain back on all of this to the public. So it seems like well, this may be a silly question, but it seems like there's so many people that are potentially getting quite old that are part of this control group. Does that bode well for us that the powers will be transitioning that or or will it not? Or 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 do we need to worry about someone like a Elon Musk or, you know, who is it that it is that we need to worry about? And do you think that the transition is happening into something else because it's been going on for essentially like a generation? It's been going on for uh, about four generations. So uh, in reality, it's gone through multiple levels of evolution. The big question in my mind, since now there's a pathway for the disclosure of all this to begin to happen in earnest, officially. Now, my project called the Disclosure Project, which started as Project Starlight in the 90s when we were doing briefings for the Clinton administration and members of Congress quietly, and I'm a you know emergency doctor, and I would fly up from my hospital in North Carolina and do these meetings in Washington. It was a crazy life, you know, with four little children, I have four daughters. One of the things that I, I discovered in that process is that the president of the United States at the time was not briefed on this, neither was his CIA director. Members of the Senate Intelligence Committee and other and chairmen of key committees like the government, over, House Oversight Committee that oversees the government, he came to a briefing I did. He said, I have never been able to get an answer on this. This is deep black. And these are people who are have top secret clearances in the U.S. government. I then ended up briefing the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Tom Wilson, J2. It's called J2. And he puts, the, you know, he's in charge of the intelligence briefings for the whole Joint Chiefs of Staff. And it was at the Pentagon. And he clearly said, you know, he was not only not allowed into the projects. He knew they existed, 
but he was threatened for asking about them. He was threatened with demotion and, and worse. So I think one of the problems is there's an unconstitutional criminal operation. There's no other, there's no way to put lipstick on that pig uh, that has uh, gotten out of control since the 50s. I think, I think Eisenhower on his watch, no fault of his own, had, was outmaneuvered and the, uh, this covert group escaped constitutional oversight by the president. So is there just one main group? Uh, if there, if, you know, we are with, uh, let's call them uh, ancillary support. And of course, it's very compartmentalized. I know people who've worked on very high little projects, and they won't know what the person in the next cubicle is working on. It's TSSCI, Top Secret Special Compartmented Information. And that's all that, done all the time. But this one is one that's deep black instead of black. Now, for example, I've met with people who managed the black budget of the United States, but they were denied access to the UFO, UAP, extraterrestrial issue, but they knew it was going on. You know, the mainstream media doesn't want to touch this. It's the third rail of, of uh, politics and, and what have you, but also the economy. The children of Earth are living on a planet that is headed towards sort of an extinction level event environmentally and also in terms of war when it's completely unnecessary. So I let, I, as an emergency doctor, I always joke, I know an emergency when I damn well see one, and this is an emergency, and we need to move on. We need to get this resolved and bring all this information and technologies out. And by the way, we need to have enlightened people making contact with these civilizations and not a bunch of sociopaths and, and criminals. What is it that, the, that this group wants to put into effect that they're going to use the mechanism of fear for. Because as you said, if there's a false flag, it's to bring mm -hmm. people together, but not in unity and love and mm -hmm. hope and joining right. hands. It's a, a fear-based coming together. So sure. you know, with, with the mechanism of fear, what is mm -hmm. it that they want to implement? It's about power and global power at a large scale. I mean, everyone knows as a matter of public record now, even mainstream media, PBS, uh, uh, CBS 60 Minutes have reported that uh, uh, the vice president, Dick Cheney, fabricated um, false information about Saddam Hussein having weapons of mass destruction in Iraq that justified us going into Iraq and invading Iraq after 9-11. It turns out that Colin Powell, who had been chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and at that time was Secretary of State, was completely gaslit by the intelligence operation in the West Wing by Dick Cheney, not by W, not by George W. Bush. And he was sent up to the United Nations holding up vials of yellow cake uranium, saying this is what Saddam Hussein has, he's a threat to our national security, it's all come out now that was all fabricated out of thin air. And so we have trillions of dollars spent, hundreds of thousands of people dead over a concocted. So you don't have to go back to ancient history yeah. to see how this happened. So I tell people, uh, unfortunately, people don't follow these things very well. I mean, it's not like it, it's sort of hidden in plain sight. There'll be a little bit of news reporting and it vanishes. And the next thing anyone cares about is you know, Kim Kardashian's uh, bra size or whatever it is, is you know, important. Uh, excuse me for my sarcasm. But um, no, they're, they want to know how she lost weight. That's totally what they want to know these days. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, you know, deep underneath this, it's really a story of uh, power, but also what the power that's behind uh, new science and technologies. Imagine if you had a device that would fit on that table where you are. That would run your house or even a small pack that would run your car, never have to be plugged into the grid. So all Tesla cars, for example, which are fake, a real Tesla would not have to be plugged in. You know, if you're plugging it into the grid, it's, it's, it's not a real Tesla. Tesla actually had a technology where he had an electric car running without it being plugged in, pulling energy out of the electromagnetic field around it. So yes. I think that this is the sort of thing where you go, well, you know, JP Morgan told Tesla, if we can't put a meter on it, we don't want it to come out. That's right. Well, this, what was true in the 20s is true 100 years later in 2023. So the more things change, the more they stay the same. And so I think that, you know, we're talking about something that would liberate the planet from poverty and pollution and all this, but it would also, th th this centralized power that has evolved from the big industrial 
interest in the 1800s and 1900s, that would dissipate. Because in every village, every town, every individual would be self-sufficient. And these are called, just so people have the scientific name, quantum vacuum or, or zero-point energy uh, systems. And they're electromagnetic field systems. I'm not going to put everyone to sleep with the physics of it, but we know what the physics uh, is. And in fact, uh, Dr. Uh, Casimir proved the zero-point field in, 19, in the 1950s. So, you know, I mean, about the time, you know, I was born and, you know, I think that this is why people, this is why this next documentary is going to actually document from the early 1900s to now, what do we have in these covert programs? Who's kept them secret and why? Uh, and that's what's going to be in the lost century. And um, I hope you can come to the premiere when we get the date fixed. Yeah, that would be, I'm sure it'd be just as awesome as every other film that you've made. What are you most afraid of right now? I don't have personal fear, although I've certainly been threatened. You know, with what you do, there's always a risk for the sort of um, things that you talk about and expose. But but within the realm of shifts within the world, what mm -hmm. is it that you are the most afraid will come through or come to fruition? I think my biggest fear is the extent to which the public and the media can be manipulated like we saw in the last month but on a much higher scale. Similar to what happened, I know this is controversial during COVID, where now even the World Health Organization has said the lockdowns were counterproductive, et cetera, and so on. And as a doctor, every doctor I know knew that in March of 2020. I don't know a single, well, except some idiot bureaucrats in the government, but, but on, honestly, Every clinical smart doctor I know knew that. Um, they know science. They know clinical medicine. But so you see how easy it is to, to pull the trigger on something, get all the media lined up around a narrative, gaslight the entire population, but with huge consequences. You know, it's estimated that about 10 times as many people globally died from the lockdowns from disease and lack of access to health care and, and famine than who died from the virus. So you have to ask the question, uh, you know, how, how easy it is to sort of manipulate people unless, as Eisenhower said, there is an informed and awake citizenry, which would be us, us, you know, ordinary people. I'm not in government. I mean, I know everyone, a lot of people, but I'm not in that. I'm not elected. I'm not appointed. I'm a private citizen. However, that is so, uh, I'm really worried that a man who came to me in the mid-90s, um, who had been on an interagency deep black project group, he says, he says, I was on a committee in 1974, so almost 50 years ago, where we could push a button, the skies would be filled with all kinds of these man-made UFOs. They could mm. attack or do certain actions. Wow. And it, and, it, and it would be, you know, it would create such fear. And he said, because the president and the Congress don't know we have these assets, they would be stampeded into all kinds of responses. And so would the public and the press. So when he, and I, if he was the only man I had met with who had been in a top secret operation like that, I would have discounted it. But I've met many of them who know about this agenda. And so that is my biggest concern, is that if the, if the public and the media aren't aware of all this, and the president and the National Security Council are, and most of the Congress, virtually all of them, then they could all be deceived in this kind of operation. So I think that's my biggest concern. And when I was on a, I was on a four-week trip until recently, and all this nonsense broke, you were, and I were texting back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I said, yep, yeah, this is what we predicted. Most people who look at my materials from the 90s went, wow, you know, Dr. Greer was saying that this is the kind of direction they're going to move in in the future. So my concern is that as we move forward with a dispositive disclosure on this, and now the Congress has gotten behind a pathway to do that, that they could actually push that button. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a very big concern of mine. It sounds like there's a sector of people that are uninformed. And so a lot of that. Everybody. Of that, yeah. So <laughs> what are the questions that you get when you do these presidential briefings and 
everybody at the top of their top of their group what 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 kind of questions are they asking you like the ones you're asking they don't know anything i mean interestingly i mean it, it was i remember meeting years ago back in the early 2000s with a member of the senate intelligence committee who ironically was from the state of nevada which is where area 51 nellis air force base is and uh, it's very funny how that meeting happened. I was put on a, one of those little golf courts, uh, car, go, golf carts at McCarran Airport in Las Vegas. Yes. And I was we were, I was moved in clandestinely to what looked like a janitor's closet, and the, it ended up being a, a place where VIPs could meet. And the senator and his chief of staff were in there, and we have this very extensive meeting about this. And you know, he says, "Look, you know, this is my home state." I'm on the Senate Intelligence Committee. I have a, I've heard these things, but I have never been briefed on it or read into it. So now you take that experience that I've had here and all over the world with senior government officials, and they're really, I feel very compassionate for them because everyone thinks, oh, you're the president, you're this general, you're this cabinet member. Most of them don't know anything. The ones who have known things, like Vice President Cheney, he was on this covert deep black committee since 70s and 80s, um, way back. And they're embedded in various places in government, but their job is to actually turn to their colleagues. Let's say you're a corrupt senator or congressman who knows about this because you're part of a club. It's like doctors believe each other, lawyers believe each other, NASCAR racers. Um, but Here's what happens. They turn to their peerage, let's call it, and say, oh, none of this were, is true. If it were true, I would know about it. Not, you know, I've been involved in all kinds of projects, and this is what they're trained to do. There's actually a facility on my way out to Charlottesville, Virginia, where Thomas Jefferson's house is. You go by a town called Culpeper, Virginia, and out in the country there, there's a place simply called The Farm. And this is where they, or they take people to learn how to very professionally and convincingly lie, deceive. They could pass polygraphs. But I know people who've gone through the farm. And um, it's a very effective training program, but diabolical in many ways. Uh, and not for normal, let's call it spycraft, but for folks doing this, where they're actually involved in a criminal and illegal operation that nobody is allowing the key people. Now, remember in the Constitution, if, if you do things that, you know, the reason I'm saying these pro programs are unconstitutional and, and, and criminal is that I can prove in a court of law from all the people I briefed that, and it's not just our country, United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, that if you're at that level, let's say you're the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Danica, which is like the CIA for the for the military. It's the CIA civilian defense intelligence agency is for the whole military. And I have briefed the director, the head guy at the DIA. He wasn't given the told, told where the washroom was on this issue. And so I was actually brought in to brief him at his conference room. And he went over, this is really kind of comical, he went over to his bookshelf. And he grabs a little, uh, like you get at a toy store, a little E.T. doll. And he says, this is all I've ever gotten for my inquiries through channels at the Defense Intelligence Agency. Someone just was making fun of him. <laughs> so I'm going, yes, I'm not surprised that's happened because I, prior to you, briefed all these other senior officials who have been also uh, denied access. When In 93, when I met with the director of the CIA and learned that he and the president had been denied access, that's when I knew we were in big trouble. So if they don't know anything, and if they're not part of this deep black covert group, are they so bad? Is the government so bad? Are they a different level of it, maybe? Like a, mm -hmm. just a one step below? Can we trust the government? Oh, well, I, don't, I think even the founding fathers would say you never just trust the government. That's why we're <laughs> supposed to have the fourth estate, the media and the public and elections. But the problem is, is if that if it, you can't blame people for what they don't know or don't even know the questions to ask. So getting back to your point, many of the things that people are when I meet with these sort of folks that, that what they're asking is, to be honest with you, they know less than someone who has looked at the documentary unacknowledged.
which you can still see for free on Amazon Prime or Hulu or, or Tubi or whatever, because they're so busy with a million other pressing issues that this issue, until it gets put on their radar, and it, and and they, people, someone says you need to take a look at this. Yeah. But these people are very busy. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it's it's very hard to get them to focus on something that has been deliberately relegated to the realm of coops and conspiracy theory. It's going to rise to the top of the rise to the top of the uh, to do list, though, with everything that's been going on lately. It seems it is. It's beginning to get there. And uh, now the problem is, about a year ago, I'll say this. I need to be careful what I'm saying here. In February of 2022, I was contacted by an extremely senior person who had been tasked with looking into this. And this was someone who should have had an all-access pass on everything black budget and classified. Uh, he's at that level. And he said, uh, you know, I know that we're being deceived. And uh, we now realize that. They had been chasing their tails for a couple years um, since the first bill was passed, mandating that the government and the Pentagon report to Congress on this, but they've never gotten anything meaningful. So this guy turned to me, he says, can you help us? I said, oh yeah, what do you want? So we're in this secure facility. Um, you know, a SCIF is a secure compartment and information facility. Uh, it's you know, classified and you, you give up your cell phone and it's electronically so all this stuff. Um, and I gave him everything. So I'm still, what I'm doing right now, I have handed off a, about a four or five terabyte hard drive that is a massive intelligence collection that we have. And I, in it, I name every facility, every corporation, where the gates are, where the deep underground bases are, et cetera. And based on that, in the last year, they've been able to hit pay dirt. They've been able to get in. Um, but it's dangerous. I mean, it's it's very dangerous. I mean, there were, you know, you know <laughs> we got put on the, the watch group list, which is the kill list. Were um, the uh, men in black just about to show up? Are the men in black real? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, they're just operatives. I mean, they're just sort of, and some of them are sort of these weird um, kind of uh, quasi-drone operatives. Uh, you know, people need to remember that you know most like the the one of the man, men I just debriefed uh, last spring was at Nellis on a on a team retrieving uh, both extraterrestrial and man made UFOs that that we in the ET ones that we electromagnetically directional energy weapons hit down. Uh, but the man made ones. Are we doing that all the time? Uh, Are we doing that all the time? Well, we've documented 119 cases where these objects have been targeted and downed and that is going to be revealed it is in the hard drive now here's some news for your folks and you're invited to come on june 10th and 11th in washington dc we're going to hold a conference at the jw marriott between the white house and the congress about all of this and then on the 12th of june monday we're having a massive national press club event where this, all of this is going to be unveiled and we're going to turn it over to the media and to the Congress and say, go get them. And we are not, the only thing I'm redacting are the personal names of top secret guys and women who want to be kept secret and their cell numbers and emails and stuff. Will but I have a number of them. Now at the national press club, because I know you had that mm -hmm. coming out party with everybody you know, yes. what year was that? That was in 2001. So this right. will be Disclosure Project 2.0. Okay. And we, so, we, we we so, so we, ha yes. we have about 10 times more whistleblowers and evidence than we did in 2001. And uh, it's something that's important that we do this. And I'd like to have a lot of folks like you there with your podcast covering it. Yeah. What? Um... And by the way, I still need that NASCAR trip. Oh, yes, of course. I've, I've never been in one. I grew up poor in the South. We couldn't afford <laughs> to go to a race. I've always wanted to be in one of those cars going around a track. So, girl, we got to. I'll be. <laughs> well, first off, I'll ride. come and I'll be your personal <laughs> escort. If the if shit goes down, I'll get you out of it. <laughs> um, we got some Navy SEALs that are going to be there protecting us. And yeah, I would imagine. Uh, what mm -hmm. do you say to people? Because one of the things that you hear so commonly mm -hmm. from you know, 
people that like someone like I'm coming to mind, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, which I, he's a very mm-hmm. smart guy. But one of the things that he says are, is that where is the evidence? Like, where <laughs> is the evidence? And all I'm thinking is I'm like, I don't know. It's everywhere. Like, it's like the walls of the pyramids. It's in the video footage that you find. And so what do you say and what would be the most critical pieces of evidence that you would say that you would counter that argument to? Well, that's a canard. And and you know, I always say to people, you're either completely ignorant of the subject and haven't studied it, or you are deliberately lying. Now, I don't know the man that you mentioned. Uh, I do know that someone who is similar to him, his predecessor, Carl Sagan, was on the payroll of the CIA to gaslight people on this. I, that I know for a fact. Yeah. His two closest friends are on my team. So, and one of them had been best man at his wedding. So, you know, whether or not that gentleman, I don't know. But I, all I would say is there's a book called Disclosure that is 500 and some pages of government documents, cases, radar cases of these objects, top secret military witnesses and their transcripts that anyone who wants it can go and download it right this instant. There's a follow-up book called Unacknowledged that went with the documentary Unacknowledged. We have put online all manner of content. But if someone isn't going, you, you know, you, you can lead someone to water, you can't make them drink. Uh, but I think in some cases, this is willful blindness. And what I have found is, like, I was debating one of these kind of characters at Purdue University, who was a skeptic from NASA. And it was the aerospace engineering department for masters and PhD people and, and, and their um, professors. And what was interesting, this guy is a professional debunker, disinformation guy. Uh, I think he's retired now. His name is James Oberg. Uh, and he was out of NASA, Houston, I believe. And um, so we're going to do this debate in front of this huge auditorium. And we're having lunch beforehand, sort of in the faculty area. He looks around when no one could hear him and says to me, you're finding the truth. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. He gets up then on stage and he and the moderator totally against me, uh, debunking everything I have and attacks me, calls me everything from a a mind control expert, getting all these top secret guys to lie to a fabricator of top secret documents, even though they have their official declassification stamps on it, basically called me every ad hominem vicious name you can think in front of 800 people. Now, it didn't fool anyone, but, you know, he he was paid to do that. That is his job. Um, And, you know, so when people are irrationally close-minded, I'm a skeptic. The only reason I found out that, you know, the whole UFO zeitgeist of alien abductions and mutilations, I found out I ended up meeting with people who had been in these deep black projects who were staging those events. I'm very skeptical about most of what's out there. If you just Google this subject, it's just an avalanche of nonsense. Uh, But I tell people, yes, we have endless numbers of cases. And how many do you need? I mean, you know, I have multiple of what I'm about to describe. A case where, for example, in uh, the 80s, there was a Japan Airlines 747 heavy cargo jet going from Paris to Tokyo. And a huge extraterrestrial vehicle, the size of multi, like a, bigger than a battleship, appeared and was on the, the captain of the Japan Airlines 747. It was on his radar. It was on ground radar civilian, and it was on military radar. radar. Military jets were scrambled. A whole report came out of this. The head guy at the FAA here in Washington uh, had received all the radar tapes and all the digital data from that and he ended up it, he, there was a meeting where the cia came in and says we're taking everything this is never going to be talked about and they tried to cover it up but if you look at my youtube channel you'll look up john callahan and when he left the faa he had kept the originals of that event radar i have them in my archive so here's the problem. How many cases do you need like that where there are multiple corroborating data on this object, which was moving nonlinearly, meaning it would be 
at two o'clock mm. and in one radar sweep would be a hundred miles away instantly, almost like teleporting across the skies. Now, that sort of evidence, if I had one case like that, it'd be, but we have dozens. I think there are uh, several hundred of these sort of radar and pilot cases. So who goes in to collect because there's obviously been bodies, crafts, who collects them? Is this part of the deep black group or is this yep. the government or it, who who is going and making sure that nobody sees this stuff? Well, it's a deep black group that's a hybrid government private, let's call it. Um, and so a, a man, if one of our disclosure project witnesses who passed away a couple of years ago, Sergeant Clifford Stone in the 60s, was on one of these stream, teams. The cover for the team was an NBC team, which is nuclear, biological, and chemical. Mm. Uh, but they sometimes these guys start out doing conventional cleanups and retrievals, and then they graduate to other things like this. So there's a man that just surfaced in the last few months who was in the 2000s more recently on one of these teams. And it was run by a Delta Force group out of the northern range of the Nellis uh, range where, where Nellis Air Force Base is. And of course, further south is the so-called Area 51 facility, but they were way north. And they would have, there was a hel helicopter base and the Hilo base would deploy to areas to retrieve objects now when he first was recruited it was to recruit to, to retrieve like a, when there's an accident with a helicopter or an osprey or a military jet because there are components on that that are classified you know technologies and whatnot so and then suddenly he got moved into another level where he was then first retrieving the man-made arvs alien reproduction vehicles which we're going to show a dozen of them in this film and at the press club we're gonna we're gonna actually we have drawings we have pictures they're all going to be on the on the on the screen people are going to go wtf so this yeah. guy would, would began to get read into doing that for a few of these then the thing that made him want to leave the operation was they had electronically stunned uh i think it was about a hundred foot diameter, I have to look at my notes, uh, extraterrestrial vehicle, which came down out way out in the northern Nevada test range. And they were deployed to retrieve it. And some things did not go well. Uh, but basically, they were not able to acquire that device. Um, the ET technologies were pretty much able to put sort of everyone in sort of stasis. It's hard to describe, a, sort of frozen. Um, but he did get to see two of the ETs, a male and a female. And we have drawings. So we're going to show all the drawings. We're going to show what the crap was. And then when he was trying to escape from that program, the covert deep black projects attempted to threaten him with death. But also they tried to abduct him. And he fought off this little gray alien and he kicked it. And what looked like skin opened up, and there were all these integrated circuits and wires. It was a sort of a, a robotic, yeah. yeah, but very sophisticated. We looked, at, and but they move rather uh, robotically. But ninety nine point nine percent of the people say, "Oh, it's a gray alien, or it's a whatever." And and those are made by I know the yeah, people who make make those. I know guys who've designed them and worked on them. So I mean, are some of the extraterrestrials robots? I mean, it seems like. If we like, I mean, look what's happening in our world right mm -hmm. now and look at the look at AI and look at the robot situation. And, you mm -hmm. know, I just watched a video of a robot playing basketball and shooting mm -hmm. a basket basket. Right. And um, so it would make mm -hmm. perfect sense if you wanted to go explore corners of the mm -hmm. universe or the galaxy, at least that mm -hmm. you would mm -hmm. go send a you would go send a robot. You wouldn't send a biological human. Is that what we're coming into communication with most of the time or are we with biological <laughs> extraterrestrials there are both but usually they're biological uh, but they do have that asset let's call it that technology but remember the entire spacecraft of an extraterrestrial spacecraft is sort of on a nano bio machine level where it's on a nano molecular level it's sort of connected to the uh biological and conscious let's say thought aspect of their occupants by the way that's the foundation of the other documentary 
Yeah. I think when we first met, uh, Close Encounters of the Fifth yeah. Kind, where people can learn to make contact because, you know, you and I are talking on this thing that's at the speed of light. But if you're from the Andromeda galaxy, like that ET that came to us in Joshua Tree, by the way, we're going to be out there in April if you want to come, oh, um, National Park. Uh, and that being was from the Andromeda. So that's two and a half million light years. It's out of our galaxy. So at the speed of light, even if they could travel at the speed of light and communicate it in two and a half million years to say, hello, dear, how are you this morning? And another two and a half million years to answer back from their base, their star system. So we know that their technologies are bypassing linear space and well, we, the we don't really light. understand quantum entanglement really yet. So, yeah, you know, maybe once we do, we do, they do. Yes, we do. <laughs> we do? What is Covert it? Covert program. Yeah. So the way to look at it is that the ultimate entangled aspect is the consciousness field. But right. that has, you have to kind of redo the whole cosmology, which I've done. It's actually up on our YouTube channel. But this gets to a deep dive of stuff. But Good. From the uh, uh, the sort of undifferentiated conscious field, how does all of that, which is infinite and, and omnipresent, how from that do we get, you know, this glass of water? Well, that's known. I mean, that's something that in the Vedas was described. Science has now done experimentation with consciousness and thought that proves that it can interface with a quantum uh, n random number generators, for example, like Dr. John at Princeton, who, who I knew before he passed away. So I think there's a great deal of evidence and research on this. Now, what we what we don't quite have, I know Elon Musk is trying to get there with Neuralink, is a reliable way where I can just think to this computer and it inter it does what my thought is, all right? People are doing things with brain waves and all that stuff, but that's at the speed of light. I'm talking about the quanta of thought, the yeah. speed of thought. And the extraterrestrial civilizations, they have both the innate ability, mm -hmm. let's call it telepathy and remote viewing, like the CIA remote viewing program, where it's just consciousness connecting. But they also, interestingly, have what I call CAT and TAC. Is they have technologies that connect with consciousness. Okay. okay, so you can have something where your consciousness is augmented by a technology, but also you where like your augment conscious the, augment the cup, augment the glass, augment the craft. Mm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yes. And actually make things happen through thought, but mm. also your ability to do so can be enhanced through some of these technologies. Because it's um, your it's they, your perception of the situation. It's your viewing of it. It's you right. paying attention to it with your consciousness mm. that creates it because mm. now non-locality has been proven that like the, nothing is here unless you observe it, like an atom and object. Right. So right. that is what it's oper is operating at that level. Mm -hmm. Well, and even the father of modern quantum mechanics and uh, particle wave theory, Erwin Sch Schrodinger said in, I think, 1908, the total number of minds in the universe is one. It's a singularity. Right. So I tell AI people, the actual singularity you're looking for, you have it already. You're conscious and you're awake. You just have to study the science of consciousness. But see, when you're dealing with civilizations that are interstellar, there's no way that they could go from one star system to another using linear speed of light communication or travel. It's too far. So mm -hmm. now you're dealing with technologies that are what are called trans-dimensional physics. Mm -hmm. And that has been studied uh, for decades in classified projects. I've been studying it pretty much my whole life. Well, since I was uh, 17 when I died, I had a near-death experience and I went, wow. You know, there's something more in the cosmos. So I started studying consciousness and meditation before I was a doctor, became a meditation teacher and was this itinerant meditation teacher going around the world. But um, in my misspent youth, but it was fun. What a great what a great skill to have from an early mm -hmm. age. Probably yes. played pretty well into your into your practice as a doctor as well. <laughs> oh, it did. I, I can tell a lot of great stories. I think every doctor should go through a meditation training program so that they have not only the science they need, but the heart and the consciousness. Um, because I had, like, I had a, a boy come in, um, well, boy, young man, 26, and he uh, he came in with all the symptoms of the flu. 
and it was flu season. And so the nurse put him in a regular medical room and I was busy with a lot of, but he was pretty sick. So I went in and saw him. He had two kid, two little kids and his wife. I looked at him and I could see it's like remote. You know, I could feel and see, you know how dogs can pick up things. I'm sort of like a giant dog. If dogs weigh 230 pounds and, <laughs> and I literally saw that he had a brain tumor. And he didn't have any, the, all of his symptoms were the flu, fever, chills, uh, nausea, vomiting, da, 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 da. And I just said, I, I, you know, it's, again, I just saw it. And I told, turned to the nurse, I said, I want a stat CT scan of the head. And she, he, she just got, she was North Carolina. Well, honey, he's only got the flu. I loved it. I said, just do it. That was my mantra. Just do it. You know, so back then we didn't have every, you know, bean counter bureaucrat in the government insurance companies looking over your shoulder 24 7 you just order it and get it yeah because this was back in the 90s and so he goes back and they call back with an emergency call back he's herniating his brain stem what does that mean the tumor it was an astrocytoma like a pancake over the top of his brain but it had gotten big enough with the swelling it was pushing the brain stem down through the opening at the base of the skull and it was hitting the all the parts of the that part of the brain that caused fever nausea all the symptoms of the flu but he didn't have the flu at all in 12 hours if i'd sent him home with some flu medicine he would have died in 12 hours so i tell people i mean it's kind of a bizarre story but that sort of thing happens a lot once you right. um become you know a, a, a aware of the fact that the consciousness whereby you and I and all humans and all ETs have it is an infinite field. And so this is actually a very exciting area of science and should have been. Uh, yeah. but, but, you know, but that's also something that the intelligence let's, community doesn't want people to know. Right. Let's talk about that because, you know, I feel like, I feel like even this, there's just a general sort of thought or belief mm -hmm. that there's technologies being withheld for healing purposes. Oh, so, you know, coming from not only, of course, what you're doing right now, but your medical background and all of the people that you know, mm -hmm. what, I mean, what is it, uh, I want to talk about the future, right? Like what could come along with healing, what could come along with energy and anti-gravity, all that kind of stuff. But let's start with healing. Mm -hmm. Are there healing modalities for cancer and very and 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 tumors and um you know medical conditions that are life threatening 100% yes and in fact i was at a classified medical research facility in el paso years ago on the border of mexico i think the actual facility might have tunneled down and was under under mexico um and they had technologies that were these very advanced transdimensional physics electromagnetic systems where they could repair a severed spinal column if, if say someone's paralyzed from the you know and they had technologies where if you had a missing limb you know people have phantom pain but if you study it sounds very metaphysical but there is what the mystics would call the astral body or body of light well that energy field is still there it's very subtle yeah. but they had technologies that could attach to that and then regrow the limb that was missing so, I mean, as a doctor, I went in there and I went, wow. I mean, you know, because I'm using the best I have access to as a doctor at the time, which is, you know, kind of caveman era stuff when I think about it. Scalpels. But, um, and scalpels. And this, and yeah, yeah. And chest tubes. And, you know, but it works. I mean, you know, you, you can say hey, lives. I thank but, God for medical, like modern medicine right now. Like even yeah, as it is, yeah. it saves a right. lot of lives. But we could be so much further along. This right. is the point. So then, then you just extrapolate this across uh, every other discipline. You know, um, one of the whole last part of the lost century, and actually there's a website for it, the lost century film.com, because we crowdfund all of our, our, our films. We don't allow a corporation or a media company to fund it because I don't trust them. Yeah. <laughs> the old saying, he he who has the gold rules, you know, they're always going to want to take out stuff. I go, nope, I have final cut over this. <laughs> um, I have total control over what it goes out. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that 
with it, it, it you'll see in this last segment the last part of that film is a whole we 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 spent a lot of money doing motion graphics showing what the world would look like after all this begins to come out in 50 years 100 years 200 years 1000 years on and on because I predict that within about 20 years of the disclosure of these sciences, we would have no poverty in the world and no pollution. The world would be restored to a pristine state. Uh, and because most of the expense of everything is the energy associated with digging it up out of the ground, manufacturing it, shipping it. Think of that at every stage of that supply chain and what have you. It's all energy intensive. And where's the energy coming from? Oil, gas, coal, about you know 90%. We have a little bit of renewable, but it's almost trivial um, at this stage. And it, it's never going to be significant uh, until we bring out these high-tech classified technologies. But unfortunately, we estimate that there's over $800, $900 trillion in assets in these old dinosaur-era smokestack commodities and unfortunately, that's a lot of power and a lot of powerful interests. So we're, we're kind of stuck. You know, we either have to find a way to bring these technologies out and try to give as soft a landing as possible to everyone working in oil, gas, coal, public utilities. Because you're not going to need a power company or transmission lines because every single home and business and your car will have its own electromagnetic power plant. And this is not an urban myth. By the way, this we will prove. We have you'll get it from the ground. It. The ground will be your. Uh, you're getting it from the fabric of space time. So okay. think oh, of it this way: if, Tesla even if was more with the ground, right? Tesla was from the ground. Magnetic, yes, some of his. Now he back then he didn't quite know. He knew the effect with a very high voltage system, mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of Faraday in the late 1800s, others. I'm not sure they quite understood the physics of it because it hadn't been elucidated. Mm -hmm. uh, it is understood now, frankly. And, and I think that when the public understands what's at stake here, I think whether you're a good old boy like the guys I grew up with in North Carolina with a pickup truck or you're you know, a policy wonk concerned about energy supply or the environment or what have you, you're going to say, well, may, if this is true, and it is, then we need to at least put some effort into an R and D effort. One of the, one of the punchlines of the film is not only showing the future, but showing the pathway to get there. How do we get from here to there? I think we need, here's what I think. I think we need to have an open source energy research lab. Now, you know, you need 50 to hundred million dollars in seed money, but I mean, in Silicon Valley, they put a billion dollars in every kind of lame brain idea every week. Um, <laughs> They really do. I mean, it's you know they're called unicorns. It's, you know, oh, yeah, somebody you know a, a new video to show your kitty cat playing the piano or some other frivolity. But I know my commentary. But I think that really it would not be that difficult. I think in, within about two years of standing up an open source lab. Open source means no patents, no intellectual property, and I would have the lab live streamed with blockchain backup so that every breakthrough we need a have, whole lot of people um, with no egos then well you have to have people who care about humanity and the earth and, and gaia than about the almighty dollar um and you know i think that's possible there, there are philanthropic people out there um i gave up my medical career to do this What's the role of, you had mentioned it earlier, and I had just thought of it because one of the questions I had was about the moon. What's the role of NASA? You know, if we like lost the technology, speaking about technology and, you know, open sourcing and letting everyone contribute, it's like, what's the role of NASA right now? If you, if you were to take every agency and part of the government, there would be a very small, highly compartmented deep black aspect of it. So that does exist in NASA. All of them. Now, it, that means 99 plus percent of everyone that works for NASA has no knowledge of it. Uh, my uncle was Northrop Grumman that had the contract to build a lunar module that landed on the moon the first time with Neil Armstrong. And uh, as a little boy, that was a cool thing to be involved with. But um, you, the, the reality is he was not read in to this level at all because he was dealing with jet thrusters and rockets and all that 
Um, so I think that, you know, I, the best way to describe it is I have a very good friend who used to work for a JPL, Jet Propulsion Labs in California, and he, he Dr. Richard Haynes, and uh, he worked with me in the 90s on a lot of this, and he said, yeah, NASA, we call it white-collar welfare. <laughs> These are because we know we're not doing anything. I mean, those of us who understand this subject, you know, we're making nice salaries and we're doing make-believe whatever, and we're we have putting the uniforms and the helmets, yeah. but what? Yeah, what? We're, and we're putting rock. You know, I told someone that Elon, the SpaceX with Elon Musk. Yeah. I said rockets were really cool in the 40s and 50s. <laughs> but right now it's like, really? Come on, dude. Um, but I mean, he doesn't want to touch this because I think he, he thinks, you know, he'd be assassinated or something. Why, why, why did we lose the technology to go to the moon? We didn't lose the technology. It just the ones that were these anti grab devices. Um, they never wanted the public to know the traditional rocket systems um, and going there and the, that put the guy bosh on that after the landing, because when we landed, there were other assets there. What, what was there? If you look, if you read the unacknowledged book that goes with the documentary, you'll see there's a testimony from a great guy named Carl Wolf. He was out here at Langley Air Force Base at a national security agency, highly compartmented operation where he saw in 1968 the early digital downloads of what was called the lunar orbiter that was going around the moon, mapping the moon so we'd know where to land in 1969. And in some of those images were ancient structures, uh, and also there were some newer ones, structures. Now, this is 1968. Is this on the dark side of the moon? Is this the side that we don't ever see? It was in the area between where the, 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 where the light that we see and the dark, that area, uh, as the moon. Of course, the moon spins, but it's just the way it's with us. We always see that one side. But w my point is, is that uh, when the sun's shining on it, anyway, the, it's just the motion of the moon and the, the earth and the sun. It was known that it was likely we were going to have something like that happen. So when we landed, at the uh, landing site, the Tranquility Sea, uh, the crater above it was quote unquote crowded with these UFOs sitting there. And I know this for a fact. Buzz Aldrin knows it. Neil Armstrong knew it. I tried to get Neil to come, Neil Armstrong to come forward, but he told his one, his, one of his best friends was worked with me and he says, yes, but he's been told if he ever talks about that, he, his wife, his kids, and his grandchildren will be killed. They'll wipe them out. Yeah. So I said, look, I'm not going to force the issue, but I know what happened when we landed. I know what was there, you know, how it got covered up, how the signals were intercepted and things erased from the footage before the public would see it through a relay based out of Australia. At any rate, the, the point I'm making is that, yes, I mean, so I think at a certain point it was decided Maybe we shouldn't be going back. So they, they, after a few more events, they sort of wound down that moon project. Uh, initially, we were going to build a, uh, a base up there and do all kinds of stuff. Now, keep in mind, it wasn't just extraterrestrial assets. There were man-made assets. Already on the moon? From before? From, yes. from the ancient times? No, from this covert group. So remember... Let me give your folk, your listeners a date. October 1954 was the date we mastered what's called gravity control, these electromagnetic field systems. So uh, one of the things we're going to show in the lost century and at the National Press Club, the National Press Club event in June may happen before the film's out. I, I, the distributor's still trying to fix a date. But we're going to show that whole film at the, the two-day conference before the press club. Uh, on that Sunday evening. It's going to be the Washington, D.C. premiere of this. But in it, people are going to see the testimony and the drawings and the and the uh, artist rendition of this air show at Norton Air Force Base in 1988, where uh, we have someone who was in there, who, and we have the transcript of what he just saw and described that he gave, mm. that were three of these man-made, uh, circular UFOs. I think one was about 25, 30 feet, one was 50, and one was 100 feet. And they were just floating above in a hangar in a classified man area. Man-made, human-made. 100% man-made. And those were kind of... How did they know they were man-made? 
Oh, it was clear. They were being shown as deep black classified aircraft. I mean, that's what it was. Um, and so, and it was really a pitch to, to, to certain people uh, to get more money for the project. But the man who saw this, the interior, the components were from the Mercury era, meaning late 50s, early 60s. And it, they, it had markings on it where it clearly, and they were told it had been all throughout the solar system. So we're talking late 1950s, early 1960s. We had electrogravitic anti-grav objects that had gone out of the Earth and around the solar system. If that technology existed in the 50s, which seems like when everything started to happen with interactions with extraterrestrials and perhaps crafts and reverse engineering things, did they do it that quick? Or was it, or is it, how long did it take them to create those? Okay, again, this, let's unpack that for a minute. We unpacked this in the lost century, this movie coming out. If you go all the way back to the late, mid to late 20s with uh, T. Townsend Brown and the Kowski Frost experiment in England and uh, Germany, there were very high voltage experiments where when you put very high voltage um, frequencies around certain crystalline materials or certain um, circuits, the darn thing would lift. And this, this was well documented actually in a physics journals back then in the late twenties. This is why I call this the lost century. It's a whole century of exotic, really cool science. And, um, that was being worked on and studied eventually, uh, what was called the B field, B I E F I E L D, B field Brown effect from T Townsend Brown and this other scientist became a real area of, of research. Now, that went forward and then adolf hitler his secret program we had the atomic bomb he was working on these electrogravitic man-made sort of anti-gravity craft that would you know kick the the the, the stuffing out of our you know uh, army air force during world war ii but he did not perfect that before the war ended and so uh, senator john warner who is the republican senator who passed away last year his son, uh, John Warner IV, I met with, and we've interviewed him. And he talks about how his grandfather, his mother's father, Paul Mellon, one of the few billionaires in the world at the end of World War II, went over to Germany, got this disc. Now, there was the so-called Nazi bell. This is an actual disc. It was anti-gravity. And uh, Alan Dulles, who helped found the CIA, and, and Paul Mellon, and uh, George S. Patton went over there, secured it, brought it back to the United States at the end of World War II in 1945. Um, and then we had Operation Paperclip, where we brought over the most brilliant Nazi scientists like Werner von Braun, Hermann Oberth, others. Now, so the research that had been done 20s, 30s, 40s, then got greatly boosted, let's say, by the downing and study of the extraterrestrial vehicles of the 1940s and 50s. So you had two big rivers combined in terms of scientific research, very black, very classified, that then resulted in this breakthrough where they actually were able to control accurately what they call gravity control and one of these electromagnetic devices. What Hitler had was unstable. And actually, the early ones that you see from the late 40s and 50s in some of the old movies, you'll see this UFO, and it looks like it's fluttering like this. That's a, that's a man-made one where they hadn't gotten the control of it mastered. It, it was unstable. Yeah, it wasn't a stable uh, flight system at that point. Okay. But where they got good gravity control was October 54. By the late 50s, we had the man-made ones. Unfortunately, they've also been used in simulating ET events with abductions and other things so the the public not knowing what i just told all of you guys are going to see something like this and go oh the aliens did i said yeah right that's a that's one of my uncle's company's classified objects or a lockheed skunk works object or a raytheon triangle hmm. okay so now we're so, to the 60s the three crafts are on the moon and we well, no. What, I'm just saying these other craft have gone all through the soil. What which yeah. ones were up on the moon? Yeah, I don't have enough information to know whether those were ours or extraterrestrial. Oh. It's quite possible when we landed on the moon, 
there were ETs who were there because they were concerned that the Apollo mission was a proxy for the Cold War and the Soviet and American competition. And I think there's a policy out there amongst these advanced civilizations that you don't go out into space unless it's in a peaceful, unified purpose. You don't do it for conquest and military purpose. I think it's a major directive from a from these civilizations, which, by the way, there are many, many of them. It's not just one. And so I think there is a policy not to let a primitive, um, violent civilization such as ours too far out there so i cannot tell you that's us I right not, I, I personally have not seen the footage i know people who have seen the footage of those objects that were at, of when we landed um but i don't know from the description i can't tell you if it was one of our man-made ones or an extraterrestrial there are certain things you can tell an extraterrestrial vehicle is seamless even the light from it is unusual because it's so pure. A man-made one, if you're close enough to it, it's going to have seams, it's going to have rivets, it's going to have parts. The interstellar ones do not because of how they're manufactured, which we're also going to show in the movie. We're going to show actually how they bring from a trans-dimensional field of, of energy into 3D. It's like trans-dimensional 3D printing, but the whole craft it's this integrated, seamless object. And so are their suits. Their suits uh, don't have buttons and zippers. They materialize on and off. I know, you know how that's done, and they're very interesting technologies. So if you know what to look for, sure. you're not going to be fooled. But this is such a granular level of information. Um, and so for most people who would encounter a man-made UFO with critters that look like aliens, they're going to get tricked. You know? Yeah, sure. Because we haven't seen any of it. Why are extraterrestrials interested in us? Well, I think there are two things. Uh, one, they see the great promise of humanity, but they also see that we're in a really big problem right now. So if you look at the modern era, and this is not talked about often, and I want to emphasize this. If you look at the modern era of the UFO issue it all started really in the 40s and particularly when we detonated the first atomic bomb why not only was that like a big red flag going up over the planet saying wow these gorillas are getting a little out of crazy here we're 98 percent identical to gorillas and chimpanzees some of us more than others speaking for myself what i've learned is that everyone knows what an electromagnetic pulse is from an atomic bomb or nuclear bomb what people don't hear about is that there is another uh, electromagnetic burst that goes faster than the speed of light it's called longitudinal or scalar and that actually tears the fabric of the universe and it's not just localized to earth it actually disrupts communication and let's say trans-dimensional travel mm -hmm. systems that are interstellar so when those went off it was a huge concern. And this is why all through the 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, there was surveillance by these ETs over all of our missile sites, nuclear weapons story. And it wasn't because they're hostile. Now, the way the media has begun to spun this and the UFO kooks is that it's an alien invasion of our nuclear silos. I'm going, get over yourselves. If they wanted to hit a button and terminate all life on this planet, they could do it instantly with what they have technologically. It was because our sciences have been misused for war. And when you cross the nuclear threshold, never mind interstellar transdimensional physics, which are even more potentially dangerous, if you haven't become socially and spiritually a peaceful planet living together in peace, you are an existential threat to yourself and to others. Now, I always use that term because as an emergency doctor, if someone comes in escorted by the police or family who are as dangerous to themselves or others, you can commit them because they're, they're legally committable and insane or what have you. I think humanity right now is, view, is viewed, unfortunately, collectively a bit insane that we've allowed all these things to happen. And until we become what Michi Kaku calls 
uh, a level one civilization where we're peaceful, not level damaging one. the environment. <laughs> a level one, well, we're a level zero. So a level one would be that. Now I've <laughs> mapped out what a level 10 is. It's actually on my YouTube channel. Uh, it's oh, really, really great. Uh, oh yeah, it goes all the way up to level 10. Okay, well Amazing. what's level two? <laughs> Level, we can go through them. So level two, one, let's describe it. Yeah. You, you have these technologies out. You're not cannibalizing your environment. And poverty has been eliminated and you're really peaceful because you don't have anything to fight over. Level two is when that's become stable enough that that is a permanent peace. It's not something that's going to come and go like we have these periods of peace and then war. It's an absolute permanent peace. And then a level three, then, you know, you're get that the next, when you get to that point, you're cleared for interstellar. At that point, you can go out there. Um, and it keeps going up from there based on the level of consciousness of the planet in its aggregate. So um, meaning the development of higher states of consciousness, which I link back to the ancient Sanskrit Vedas and the cosmology that, that I learned when I was a young boy or young man. So, uh, but I think that's where, all these civilizations are at least a level, most likely four to 10. If you get on the, I mean, we don't have time to go through all that, but they're very advanced. Um, and they're certainly not violent because if they were hostile and were intrinsically that unevolved, they would never have been allowed out of their solar system. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute requirement. They would so have is been there really back, a galactic but, federation? Well, I, I mean, mean, that's something you hear about <laughs> from, you know, spiritual people and psych people with psychic natures and, mm -hmm. you know, you well, don't understand the Akashic records and things like that. Mm -hmm. And they'll talk mm -hmm. about the Galactic mm -hmm. Federation. There's an organization that's interstellar, Galactic. Remember that the galaxy is the Milky Way and it's only one of hundreds of billions of galaxies. Yes. So it's an incorrect term. Um, for example, this ET ambassador that we took a photo of that appeared at Joshua Tree a few years ago. He was from Andromeda. So it's intergalactic because he was, that's a two and a yeah. half million light years from here. It's the closest galaxy to our Milky Way. And our Milky Way has whatever it is, 100 billion star systems. Uh, and it's estimated upwards of a billion Earth like planets just in our own Milky Way. But there are billions and billions of these galaxies. Um, and so I think that you have to really look at this in a more cosmic way to get your mind around the vastness of what we're dealing with. Now, not all the civilizations that exist in the cosmos would be tasked with dealing with a civilization at our level, a level zero civilization that has not learned to be, you know, civilized because we're not. I mean, you know, there's a come to my emergency department on a Saturday night. I'll prove it to you. Um, so. You know, so that there, there's an evolutionary pathway, as I see it. And we're sort of emerging. We're sort of half a step out of the jungle. <laughs> we're yeah. trying to emerge out of that. But the hallmark of it is we're peaceful. We're not killing each other. Wars have ended. We're not ruthlessly suppressing these technologies that could uh, eliminate poverty and hunger and uh, heal the planet as well as individuals. All that has gotten resolved. And that's, that's where we've been stuck for a hundred years. See, that should have happened about a hundred years ago before even my parents were, were born virtually. So, um, so I think that this is why I tell people the only way you make a transition this big is bringing people together with knowledge and, but also with enlightenment, but also a vision of but where should we be going and how do we get there? So we try to map that out at the end, the, the last chapter of this, this documentary film, The Lost Century. But, um, of course, you know, it, it's a lot of work to do. And unfortunately, all of this should have been resolved before I was born. <laughs> you know, so it's sort of like we're all kind of stuck um, trying to resolve something that's had this momentum in these deep black projects. Uh, and and how to unravel it, but the first step is at least educate each other. But yeah, also explain that. Go ahead, go ahead and like uh, if you could outline perhaps from your perspective, or maybe it's in the film, um, or in the presentation, or what's going to happen in DC. But what are those next few steps to getting to that point? I think we need to have an open 
disclosure project. Right now, what's happening with the Congress, the people coming in there and the ones I'm identifying are going into a skiff and their testimony is classified. It needs to pivot to an open, uh, transparent process, which I'm hoping that we'll get there. Um, in the meanwhile, my group or the disclosure project, we're disclosing everything we can uh, because uh, I have top secret documents that haven't been declassified. And I think about six dozen of these witnesses who are military and corporate that we're putting out there because they say, go ahead and do it. Uh, and they can't prosecute us because we declared those projects uh, criminal enterprise in 1997. So, and that's never been rebuked. It's never been uh, corrected. We wrote a letter to all the agencies and said, here's our assessment. We're going forward. But now there's an official pathway, which a lot of, like the gentleman I, I about a month ago uh, brought here to Washington, he had very high clearances and he didn't want to say anything until there was a clear pathway sanctioned by the government for him to testify. Now we have that. That's a new, that's just in the past two months. So then the other thing I'm asking for, we need courageous men and women who have been in these covert programs to come forward as whistleblowers. Have them contact me if they break to you. But you can just contact me at info at seriousdisclosure.com, S-I-R-I-U-S disclosure.com, which is my website. Because if they contact me, and you know, I'll keep their information confidential. Very good at doing that as a medical doctor. And if they're willing, and if I think that their information warrants it, we will then arrange to bring them to Washington here. So that process is ongoing. And in fact, I was on a Navy SEAL podcast uh, a couple weeks ago called the, uh, the uh, Sean Ryan Show. It's, it's a vigilance elite and uh, it's had millions of views. And we've gotten another half a dozen top secret whistleblowers who've come forward just from that. So, you know, people looking at your podcast or maybe people or someone who knows someone. And it's all about networking this, um, but they need to know we're going to keep them safe and we're going to keep their names confidential from the public yeah. If, yeah. unless they want to be known. I, ultimately, I wish people would just all come forward with their names, everything. But th I understand people who are afraid or people who don't want to be in the public eye. Um, you know, I certainly wish I hadn't been uh, pushed into the public eye on this, but um it's ruinous to have that happen, you know, but, uh, as you know, but I think that as some people like it. I don't like it, but, um, I can't walk through an airport or go to a Starbucks without being stopped. But, and I don't like that, frankly. I mean, I like my privacy, but, um, and my kids hate it more, but I think that my point is, is that I understand someone not wanting to come forward publicly, but the more we can do this, uh, okay. publicly with their names and information. And in fact, even at this national press club event, uh, the better, but there's certainly this other mechanism where we, they'll be kept very confidential and the people I'm working with here, absolutely. You can trust they are wonderful guys. What is it that finally pushes this over the goal line? Like, what is it that will finally get everyone to go? There mm -hmm. it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Undeniable. I don't know if it's a singular event. I think it's a, a process. I mean, basically what we put out already should be that. But what yeah. people are waiting for is an official assessment and open disclosure of this by the government and the media reporting it. Whether or not we get to that or I don't, I, I, I honestly, here, here's what I thought. When I put all the, the, what is called the best available evidence together, for the president and the CIA director in 1993 and four, I thought it would be over, that the president would do the right thing. <laughs> At the time, it was Bill Clinton, that they would dig into this and it would be disclosed. They'd start bringing out these technologies. We'd have a new world. Uh, boy, how naive I was as a 30 some year old medical doctor. And, you know, I mean, in, in full disclosure, I've never worked for the government, been in the government. Work for a con done any of that. I'm completely a civilian person interested in this. I have no official standing at all. But ironically, the information we've acquired in the last 33 years exceeds anything that anyone in the constitutional government has, which is why I feel obligated to turn it over. 
So warts and all. I mean, they're getting an enormous tranche of intelligence. One, mm-hmm. I'd just be remiss to not add, ask about. I'm so fascinated with Antarctica. Mm-hmm. Is there mm-hmm. like extraterrestrial bases? Is there something inside, like mm-hmm. underground? What is the role of Antarctica? I basically want to know if I need to plan a trip and just put my MacGyver hat on and <laughs> get my well, microscope I, I, and I, check I, it I out. Can suge- I can suggest better places to go that are very close to where you live. Um, <laughs> I'd love to know those too. Mm -hmm. South Mountains. We had an ET craft come right over us when we were hiking out there uh, last year. Um, But um, right at dusk, came down. It was phenomenal. So what are the hot spots? So before we get to Antarctica then, since you're saying you know Mm -hmm. some other spots, what are the hot spots on the planet where the most amount of extraterrestrial activity is, most amount of craft sightings? Well, I, I actually think they're wherever you do the CE5 contact. Uh, protocols properly. Now, everybody can get an app. It's called CE5 Contact. It's a whole training program and remote viewing. It's the protocols for making contact. You actually open up a, 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 an interdimensional vector. You have a group of people doing that. So what I've found, if, that, if, the, if the consciousness and the group is coherent, the ET come no matter where you are in some form or another. Mm-hmm. Now, in terms of routine activity, there's a great deal uh, between Catalina Island and Malibu because there's an as- a facility there. There are ones that are certainly are out in the uh, desert near near you. Um, you go to parts of South America. Uh, there are a great deal seen happening up in Peru and those, those high Andes. Um, now, I think that there have been and are extraterrestrial uh, facilities in many places in the center of joshua tree national park in 96 i was took a group up there and we didn't quite know where to go and we'd gone to a place that just didn't feel right and then suddenly i said let's move my intuition and as we were leaving there was about a 300 foot diameter a green it was looked like a hershey's kiss with this green uh, trail and it went straight down like a rock and lit up all of Joshua Tree for just a couple seconds. Mm-hmm. And it, it it was partially materialized and went in. Everyone saw this and it went into the desert. And I noted where it went in. I got my sort of GPS in my brain looked and c- calculated it. And that's where we go to make contact. But we'll be there in April if you want to come. But that's a base. I think there's. Okay, a base. Because when you said went in, it made me think, is hollow earth really a thing? I don't know that it's so much hollow earth, but there are certain places where ET uh, transdimensional craft and uh, can operate and have operated historically. Uh, way inside Mount Shasta is one. Okay. Uh, we, right. We've gone there many times yeah. and had amazing, you know, these sort of like luminous light ships. Or we have videos of these coming out towards us. Wow. Uh, and then we have these amazing contact events happen. So, um, yeah, there are certain places, but I don't think it's dependent okay. on that. I think that you remember, given their technologies, any point in space, you know, time, they can appear if you have a group that's synchronous, coherent, doing the consciousness part of this and are also doing it for an altruistic. What is your intention? If you're just there to be entertained, they're not interested. I mean, ETs are not going to be dolphins at SeaWorld for people. I mean, it's, it's, it's humiliating. Uh, but uh, and, and my view of it, what I've experienced is when people sincerely want to be part of a process of humans uh, being sort of ambassadors from Earth to their civilization, and you're willing to be in service and help as opposed to selfishly just being on a trip, then they come. Otherwise, they're not interested because they figure you're an immature soul not worth bothering with. So Antarctica, is there anything to know about Antarctica? Anything? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of covert human assets there that are this type of craft. Now, also at the South Pole, we just have a guy who worked for Raytheon, who for a year, Raytheon's a big defense contractor, and about two miles under the ice is this massive technological array, which are neutrino light detectors which is a type of system that detects um, very subtle energy as a craft materializes from trans-dimensional space-time into 3D. 
there's an energy and there are ones on satellites in space. I know the man who invented the one and that's how we track these craft and then triangulate them and hit them with an electromagnetic weapon. So that is huge facility and it's at the South pole and Antarctica has other facilities. Um, so I'm not so sure that it's rich for extraterrestrial activity, but it's certainly a very dynamic area for covert deep black human okay. operations. Yeah. Okay. How long, in your opinion, do you think it will be before we have global collective agreement on the existence of extraterrestrials? I would not wager a bet. I was betting in the 90s that it would happen imminently. Um, you know, when, well, we were originally going originally to do the whole disclosure event at the United Nations. But then the Secretary General of the UN was threatened. And we had to move it to the National Press Club. I mean, that's a very interesting story. And uh, Paris, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, after I had met with Boutros Ghali, who was the UN Secretary General in the 90s. Uh, his his successor was also very supportive, and uh, but they were they were sat down pretty hard and said you will mm -hmm. not do this, or you'll lose all your funding. Uh, so uh, you know these guys play hardball. I mean it's a hardball game. Um, so you know and and that's the, you know that's the school of hard knocks I went through when I thought well you know, as a medical doctor and prior to that, a meditation teacher, people would do the right thing to save lives and help the planet. Huh? Then huh. I, you know, I hate to sound cynical, but I mean, at, the, at this point I go, I'll believe it when I see it. Now it doesn't mean we'd give up. We have to keep pushing that. But I don't, I, look, all, if you look at, you know, I grew up sixties, early seventies in the South, the civil rights movement didn't happen because the Kennedys just one day woke up and decided we're going to support this. It happened because organizers like Martin Luther King and the people got behind it, a nonviolent movement. That's what we have to do with this issue, both with contact with these civilizations. And I, I was involved in that. I saw that happen. Same thing with women's rights. So, uh, same thing with uh, gay rights. All these things. They didn't happen because the muckety mucks in Washington or Paris or any other place did it. They did it because we, the people, led. So I always tell people, if the people will lead, the leaders will follow. I shift the focus not on the leaders in Washington, right. but on us, right. we the people. I'm very much about we the people. Right. And I think that once there's enough movement of the people for this, then the leaders will have to follow it. So sure. that's why we're doing, that's one of the reasons we're doing this national press club. There are senior people in Washington, actually, I cannot name them, who have asked me to do that event to get more public and social pressure on the government to move forward. So, That's exciting. Yeah. All right. Well, then the last question I have is just, why do you keep putting yourself out there? In this? What, what is, what is it? What is the vision you have? Because I think I have seen what's at stake. I, I mean, I've seen the world we're in and I, and I've seen the world it could be. And when you see how amazing this planet and humanity could be, if some of these issues could get resolved properly and nonviolently, then, you know, this is the pearl of great price. This is the one you don't throw back. In my soul, I know where we could be and where we can be. And therefore, if we work hard, uh, perchance, we'll get there. But I think it's a lot of hard work. It's much harder. I mean, it's an ultra, ultra marathon which when I was first starting out doing this stuff in my 30s, I thought it'd be a slam dunk. But, you know, um, you know, you know, looking 33 years back, I go, well, you know, you, it's you learn a lot. One way or another, humanity is going to get on this uh, path where we're going to be sustainable, peaceful. All these technologies will heal, heal the planet. Poverty and disease will be forgotten, be a thing forgotten. Yeah. And we'll become interstellar. So that I see that that's where we're going to go as an enlightened civilization. Therefore, if if you don't work for that, I mean, uh, I, the way I justify having left my medical career is I kind of joke. I used to take care of all the car wrecks and shootings and all that fun stuff, but uh, now I think my our patient is is the Earth and her eight billion children. So that's our patient. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a pretty damn good reason. Yeah.
Thank you so much. I thank you. thank you for sharing. I'm excited about all your new projects coming up and yeah. there's always going to be more to talk to you about. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll send you some links so people can figure out how to come to this event in Washington and the yeah. Washington premiere of the film. And um, hope to see you there. Maybe you could do a podcast from uh, the National Press Club. That'd be pretty cool. I would love that. That would be cool. All righty. Hope that. to Congrats. see you soon. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.